Since 1950, late mid-1950s, the United Kingdom has produced enough plastic to cover the whole of the United Kingdom in almost a meter of plastic. A massive 79% of all plastic ever produced has ended up in landfills, with only about 9% being refilled. The rest is still in use. By 2050, it's estimated that there will be a ton of plastic for every ton of fish in, this, in our seas and our rivers. America and Western Europe are producing more waste than they can or would, would like to handle, and they're literally shipping it off to poorer countries because it is cheaper for them to pay poorer countries, mostly in Africa and China, to handle their waste than it is for them to do it according to their stringent standards, and they like to look nice. The new waste is called e-waste, which is a, a waste from all our electronic devices. Garner alone receives, on average, roughly the equivalent of 15 shipping containers of e-waste from the UK alone every day. And there's, a, there's an amazing documentary on that, you can, you can watch it, where it focuses specifically on Ghana. But so much of the world that we live in today, and the reason we have so much of this waste, is because we live in a throwaway society. We live in a, a society where if something doesn't work, we simply replace it. And unfortunately, this attitude with our appliances creeps into our culture and our behavior with one another. And it creeps into how we would treat relationships with others. We don't only have these unwanted items that we throw away, but sometimes we have unwanted people who we like to treat like or discard like waste, and they become someone else's problem to leave to sort, that, to sort them out. But fortunately, God is not like that. He doesn't simply replace that which has gone awry and that which has gone wrong. He is the God of restoration. And he's not the God of second chances. He's the God of new beginnings. You see, God does this restoration in you and I through Jesus, his son. So as we come, as we come closer to Christmas, we're, you know, it's kind of a traditional time for Advent. And you've seen the, the, the kids are getting into that. But it's important for us to take a moment and just go, what is the, the reason for the season? Why are we actually doing Christmas? What is it all about? And to be sure, we must know that, that the story of Christmas is is about Jesus. And, and it's not, you know, Jesus isn't part of the Christmas story. Christmas is a part of Jesus' story. Christmas is not the beginning of Christ's story either. It's not, his, it's not his start, but it's his commission. Jesus wasn't created at Christmas, but he came at Christmas. At Christmas, God came down to earth. Emmanuel, God with us. Not just to, to see and to wander around hidden and see what's gone wrong in this planet and inflict this righteous judgment from outside, but he came down to be a human and to work his mercy within, to be like us. So Christmas is not a, a celebration either of some religious figure or religious leader that is this untouchable, but it's the celebration of the coming of God himself. And he comes as one of us to restore us and to bring dignity to us, that thing that Mike hammered so much this morning. That's what Christ has come to do, is he's come to restore our dignity in God. If you've got your Bible, why don't you turn over to Luke chapter 4. If you've got it on an app, you can click on over there. Luke, the fourth, uh, the fourth of the, the third gospel in our Bibles. Um, Luke, the, was, uh, he also wrote Acts, by the way. The book of Acts is also written by Luke. And um, he was a contemporary of Paul and a couple of the other guys that you'll recognize in the Bible. He was probably trained as a doctor. He's referred to as Luke the doctor at some stage. And the way he writes, he uses some very technical language that gives it away that he's a doctor. And so what Luke did is Luke went around and spoke to all these eyewitnesses. And, and he wanted to, and he puts it quite specifically in there why he wrote it. He said, I get to put down an orderly account of what happened. So Luke acts is actually meant to be one work. It's a two-volume single work, if you want to look at it like that. So the book of Luke and the book of Acts are same author and meant to be read in, in concession and, and with one another. But in Luke chapter 4, if you're there, we're going to read from verses 14 to 21. I'm reading out of the NRV, so yours might differ a little bit, but we'll have it up on the screen as well. Jesus returned to Galilee in the power of the Spirit. And news about him spread through the whole countryside. He was teaching in their synagogues, and everyone praised him. He went to Nazareth, 
where he had been brought up. And on the Sabbath day, he went into the synagogue, as was his custom. He stood up to read, and the scroll of the prophet Isaiah was handed to him. Unrolling it, he found the place where it is written, The Spirit of the Lord is on me, because he has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim freedom for the prisoners and recovery of sight for the blind, to set the oppressed free, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. Then he rolled up the scroll, gave it back to the attendant, and sat down. The eyes of everyone in the synagogue were fastened on him, and he began by saying to them, Today, this scripture is fulfilled in your hearing. Praise be to God for his word. Let's pray. Father, I pray that you would make this word come alive in our hearts, Lord God. Holy Spirit, I pray that you would make your word and only your word come alive in our hearts. I pray that you speak to us and that you draw us into that restoration through your son, Jesus. Amen. Amen. Jesus, in this passage, makes three things clear. He really, he really kind of hammers over, or Luke in, in writing this thing, but Jesus and what he's speaking about makes three things clear in here. And it's his identity, his task, and his purpose. And those two might seem the same, but they're not. They're slightly different. So his identity. And what Jesus is doing by reading out of Isaiah 62, and, and you know, sometimes we miss these things being Gentiles. We don't have quite the training in the Old Testament that most Jews would have had. That was their education. They were literally taught through the Old Testament. That's how they were taught to read and write, was by copying it out and reading it. But what, what Jesus does here in reading Isaiah um, the, the prophet Isaiah, chapter 62 to, uh, 61, verse 2, to, peop, to the, the synagogue. And what he's reading in that last sentence is he makes very clear who he believes he is. And he makes it very clear to them who he is. And that his identity is the Messiah. So he is the Christ, if you want a Greek translation, but the Messiah. This figure, this, this human sal salvation figure that was going to come from God, be sent by God to come and bring liberation and freedom and restoration to the nation of Israel. Now, at his baptism, Jesus gets certain words spoken over him, and it's, a, it's, a, it's maybe a page or two back in your Bible, in Luke chapter 3, verse 22, you can read, it says that Jesus went down, was baptized by John, came up out of the water, and the Spirit dwell, uh, descended on him in bodily form, and a voice from heaven spoke, and it said, you are my son, whom I love, with you I am well pleased. How many of us long for a statement like that to be spoken over us? Given identity in that moment. Given courage. You are, Jesus had done nothing in terms of ministry. Jesus, the Son of God, had simply been obedient to Mary and Joseph, his parents. A child in their house, growing up, studying Jewish culture, Jewish, a small little town. Learned to be a builder or a carpenter, however you want to translate it. That's, learned to work. This is the God of the universe. And he's... 30 odd years, he's chosen to live like that. And God said, before he's done a single thing in ministry, hasn't prayed for a person, hasn't, hasn't healed anybody, God says, I'm well pleased with you. What a beautiful moment of identity giving from a father to a son. I want to challenge the fathers. Man, that is, that is one of your main roles, is speak identity into your kids' lives. Speak identity over them. Before they've done anything, I love you, I am well pleased with you. You, have, you can literally see a kid's chest puff out and his chin lift up as he does that. You watch it in school plays. When kids get up here and they stand in there and they're looking around and they see mom and they're like, well, mom and dad. And they're like, and they go crazy because they've, and that's, the, that's showing up. You, you, just by showing up, you give your kids a certain level of, of courage and identity that speaks, to the, speaks volumes to them. If we are to do the next two things, as we are disciples of Jesus and, and we be with Jesus to become like Jesus, to do what he did. If we are going to follow him doing what Jesus did in his task and his purpose, we need to settle this one first. We need to settle our identity in Christ first. Derek Morphew puts it like this. He says, once we have won the battle of our identity in Christ, we will be better placed to minister in the kingdom of God. Some of us want to get our identity from the things that God has called us to do. And it's the wrong way around. We think, man, I'm going to be an apostle or an evangelist or a prophet. And God says, no, 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 that's a task or a purpose. Those are important. Those are good. There's nothing wrong with those things. But that's not who you are. Settle your identity in Christ first. And then the other things, you're far more capable of doing those other things. Because you see, once our identity is settled, once that thing is settled in me, 
No one can take that away from me. Whether I fail at what I should be doing, I'm still a son of God. Whether I never ever heal a person or God never uses me to bring one person to salvation, I'm still a child of God. Does that make sense? That is the thing. Because what that does, that, that gives us unending security in who we are. That brings us to a place where we no longer need to worry about what people think about us. We no longer need to worry about, is my life going to be worthwhile? You see, identity, security and identity helps resolve all the anxiety and the issues that we worry about, the things that keep us awake at night. Are my kids going to be successful enough in their life? Well, that's up to God. Yes, we have a role as parents. But those things, the anxiety and the worry about those things, let our identity put that to bed. The second thing that Jesus made very clear in that is his task. So Jesus' task at coming and the point of Christmas, not the point, but the task about him coming, was to inaugurate the kingdom of God. He didn't start the kingdom. The kingdom always had been. God has always been king. But Jesus came to inaugurate the king, kingdom of God. So, and he does that. And God gives him this task. And he mentions it out there in, in quoting Isaiah. He says, the task that he's got in inaugurating the kingdom is preaching the gospel, bringing healing, bringing freedom, bringing release, declar declaring God's favor, bringing a declaration of the favor of God. And these are not just empty words. Because what happens is immediately after that, if you keep reading in Luke, what happens as you go through the next few chapters is that we see that Jesus fulfills what he claims to be saying in these scriptures. He sets a demon-possessed man, demon man free in Capernaum. He, say, he goes to Simon's mother-in-law, and, and she's released from a fever. He heals people of all kinds of sicknesses. And following these demonstrations, Jesus goes on not only to demonstrate the, the liberation that he brings, but also the provision, the year of the Lord's favor. This, and, and that you can read in the very next chapter, Luke chapter 5, where he gets in, in the boat and he pushes out and he says to, he starts preaching to the people, and then he says, hey, throw down your nets. And Peter, you can imagine kind of, so Peter's a very quick to speak kind of guy, like shoot from the hip kind of guy. And Peter's a professional fisherman. Jesus is a carpenter, with a, and I'm, I think Peter would have known that. Um, but he gets in the boat, and he says, man, put out to fish. And, and Peter kind of, in a very polite way, says, I'm a fisherman, you don't know what you're talking about. He says to Jesus, we've been fishing all night, and we haven't caught anything. And then he kind of has this moment of clarity where he goes, oh, wait, hang on, maybe I should just listen. And he says, okay, Lord, but because you say so, we will. And you can imagine, they've been out all night, they've just washed their nets, they've just cleaned up, and now this like telling you to make it dirty again. You're like, yeah, bro. But okay, because you're a rabbi and you say we should. And he puts, and they get such a full, they get, they get a net, that, a catch of fish that is so big that their nets nearly break. And they have to call their friends and they come and haul this catch a fish out. And so Jesus, again, demonstrating his task of inaugurating the kingdom, where he's going, on your own, you can fish for hours through the night and you get nothing. But one moment of the presence of God in your business and it's filled to overflowing. It's an incredible, incredible picture of the coming and the, of, of the year of the Lord's favor. Jesus heals leprosy or skin diseases. He heals blindness. He heals paralysis in, the, in, in these following chapters, just in Luke's account as well. And this shows his compassion and his reason for coming. But importantly, and I think for me, this is, this is something that we need, to, we need to get right, because we can do a lot. You know, there was an interesting story of, of um, Brother Lawrence, uh, oh, I can't remember now, I read it, but it was either brother, I think it was Brother Lawrence, and, he, and they brought him, is he a Chinese guy? He was the American. He was, a, was he Chinese? No, he went to China. So it might have, it was, I think it was Watchman Nee. So they brought Watchman Nee to Europe to see what was going on in Europe and showed him these massive church buildings and everything. And they said, man, it's, it's incredible to see what's going on. And he said, Watchman, he said, like, how do you, do you see the buildings and stuff? And he says, yo, it's... And Watchman Nee, if you've read his stuff, he's incredibly wise. He's got weighty words. And they said to him, what do you think? And he looked and he said, this is amazing. Like, it is incredible what you guys can do without the Holy Spirit. <laughs> <laughs> and it was... That's kind of the most backhanded compliment ever to a church leader. But it is true. Like We can do so much. We can get so involved in the task that we miss the empowering that is important. So it's not only our identity that's there, but the key is for Jesus in this task and what he was doing. And I want you to see this. Um, we're going to read just four quick scriptures leading up to where we were. Luke 3.23, 
In the baptism, it's the Holy Spirit that descends on Jesus. The voice of the Father speaks the approval and the identity from heaven, but it's the Holy Spirit that depends that descends on Jesus. Luke 4, 1, it says that Jesus, full of the Holy Spirit and led by the Holy Spirit, goes out into the wilderness or the, the desert place to be tempted. Luke 4, 14 says, he and we read it, it says he returned in the power of the Spirit. Luke 4, 18, the Spirit of the Lord is on me, quoting Isaiah 61, 1 and 2. You see, friends, our task, the thing that you and I are given to do, is going to kill us if we don't do it with the Holy Spirit. But being led and guided in the power of the Holy Spirit and under, under the unction of the Holy Spirit, when we do it in that way, it is a joyful and free place to do it. I can guarantee you that if Mike and Norley try to do what they are doing in that crash on their own, it would drive them to flippin' madness. It would drain their resources and it would kill them. But what God does is God says, I'm going to put my life in that thing. And then nothing can stop that. And it is an incredible, incredible thing. Mike, how much more do you need for the borehole? No, how much more do you need? Do you know off the top of your head? Okay, you got it. Okay, we'll cover it. Okay. The third thing Jesus does, on top of what we've already promised to give, eh? Yeah. So the third thing Jesus does, and that, in speaking in these scriptures, the third thing he brings about, is his, that he speaks clearly of, is his purpose. Jesus makes very clear what his purpose is here. You see, his purpose is not just to be showy and to prove that he's the son of God and to get a big following. Everything that Jesus does is for an individual, it's for a person. And amongst the crowds, he never misses the person. His purpose is to bring restoration to his people. That is what Jesus, that is what Christmas is about. It's about bringing restoration to people. It's about God coming in human form as a man to come and say, man, I want to restore you to the fullness that God... The coming of the kingdom of God is about the restoration of God's original creation, including humankind, into his image. You see, we were made in the image of God before. We were formed in that way. And then sin marred that. Sin broke the relationship that we have with God. And sin broke our true self. It broke who we should be. And God is saying, I want to come and restore you to who you should be. To rightly, to the person that I've made you to be, the person that I have formed you. I want to restore you into that image. Not into who you think you should be, not into a younger, better looking self with less wrinkles and, and maybe you don't have a spare tire, but God's saying, no, no, I want to restore you into this image of God creation that was created. Your true self, that's who I want to restore you into. And this is achieved through the death and the resurrection of Jesus and the coming of his spirit. And that is the new covenant that comes. And that's the difference for us, is that we don't, we don't achieve the restoration. We don't enter into the restoration of God by keeping a list of rules. We don't enter into the restoration by going, man, okay, I've got to read my Bible for this much. I've got to go to church. I've got to pray. I've got to preach the gospel to three people today. I've got to you know, tithe. I've got to do the Ten Commandments. We don't achieve restoration through putting stuff on the outside. God says it to Israel in Ezekiel. And this is the message over and over again through the Old Testament prophets. Is God going, I want to restore you. I want to bring you back to me. I want to renew you. He says it in Ezekiel. He says, man, I want to take out that heart of stone and give you a heart of flesh. God's saying, I want to bring transformation from the inside. And that's the covenant that we get in the New Testament is the Holy Spirit with us. We get the very presence of God. It is an incredible thing to think of that we get the very presence of the creator of the universe. I don't know if you've seen much of this uh, development now with the James Webb telescope. We thought the Hubble was amazing. Now we've got James Webb and it's even, it's even more amazing. And they are seeing, uh, I was listening to a, a thing this week, they are seeing hundreds of billions of galaxies, each with trillions of stars in them. And they say that if, if, you, had, if you had perfect vision, like unending vision, if you could hold up a needle at arm's length from the sky you could see tens, or no, you could see thousands of galaxies through the eye of that needle in the night sky. And if you moved it an inch to the left, you'd see thousands of galaxies, and you'd see, and you'd see with trillions of stars in them. 
the God who created all of that, the God who created that vastness and that expanse, has said, I will come and presence myself with you. That infinite God has said, I will come and be intimate with you. And I want to restore you to the way I used to be. I love this quote from Richard Rohr. He said, Jesus didn't come to change God's mind about us, but rather he came to change our minds about God. You see, some of us, we read the Old Testament, we think, man, God's angry. He's this big man in heaven. He's got a big stick, and he just wants to beat us at every turn, and he's angry, and he's mean, and he's, he's just going, you've got to stop doing this, and I'm going to smite you with the Babylonians. And, we, and then in the New Testament, Jesus comes, and God actually like changes because Jesus came, and now God's loving. And, and that's why we like him in the New Testament. We don't like the Old Testament God so much. We like the New Testament. But you see, that's, that's not what happens. God doesn't change through those things. We're reading it incorrectly, but what God does is, is through Jesus' coming, he comes to change our minds about God. And it's not about us trying to achieve any status with God. It's not about us trying to, a fear-based religion where we go, am I going to make it? Am I not? Have I done enough good stuff to make it into heaven today? Yeah, if I died today, maybe I wouldn't make it, but there's tomorrow, so I'm... What, God, what Jesus says is that no matter what you've done, faith in me, faith in my death and resurrection, for the forgiveness of your sins is enough. That is the thing that saves. What Jesus has done is the thing that brings salvation and restoration in us. And it's his life that brings that change. You see, in the, and, and, and what Jesus does in this moment in reading the scripture in the synagogue, at the, and Luke intentionally puts it at the beginning of Jesus' ministry to frame everything else that Jesus does through, through the book of Luke and, and then through the Acts as well, is that he points to... Uh, he points out this kind of sore spot that the Jews had, because if you, if you carry on reading in Luke there, they, they get a bit upset with Jesus, and they, they kind of take him onto this hill to throw him off and stone him, and they get, you've got to be pretty upset with someone if he's quoting scripture and you, you want to do that. But you see, the, Jewish, the Jews had this expectation in mind of this coming Messiah, and they saw the Messiah who was coming as this uh, kingly warrior king type like David, who was going to come and set them free from the oppression of the Roman Empire, and he was going to come and make Israel a great nation again. They had a very nationalistic mindset. And if you follow international politics, you'll know that that mindset is growing in many, many countries around the world. Where we are, we are going to, we're going to make our country great again. I'm not going to mention a country, but we're going to make our country great again. Or the people are voting, are like, we don't want to be part of that group of countries where you just let people in. We're going to be our own little island. Or we're going to vote in a president who's going to be like, no, no, it's all about us and let's build a wall. And so we have, and that's not just those two countries, but there's, there's many others around that are voting in people and parties that have got a very strong nationalistic mindset. So we are a nation and we're going to be okay and all right. And it's, it's that sort of same uh, expectation that the Jews had of this sort of freedom fighter, this political, military freedom fighter who would come in and set them free. And it's into that context that Jesus comes. And, and I think that that is the main reason that they missed the coming of the Messiah. So many of them did. Because they were expecting something else. And Jesus said, no, no, I have come as the suffering servant. I have come to lay down my life. The way that I'm going to win this battle is by dying. It's completely against what the world says. It's completely countercultural to what the world says is a win. You see, God's work in, in coming as a baby is a very small beginning. It's a very humble beginning. The backwater. He doesn't come in the main capital of Jerusalem. He doesn't come in the capital of the empire. He doesn't come to a well-off family of good standing where he could be out front and get, a court, you know, get time in Caesar's court and change the nation from the head down. He comes as a nowhere baby in kind of scandalous circumstances to a virgin who's now pregnant. Can you imagine if she was in church, some churches today? Would that be accepted? And Jesus comes into that. And a, and a baby is born in a manger, a feeding trough for animals, is where he slept his first night. And I want to say to you, if God is starting something in your life, and it is a small beginning, and there is small growth, or just a, a little change in what God, and you're looking and expecting for the big, and you're hoping for God to do immense things in your life, and you're going, man, God, this is such a small thing. Like, please, can you just help me with the, Change the big. Never be afraid of the small beginnings and the small changes that God has in your life. You see, the outcome of that small beginning in a manger in Bethlehem 
was a restoration that took place not only on earth, but also in heaven. We want God to use us in powerful ways. But are we willing to be obedient with the small things first? And I want to say to you today, friends, if, if you follow Jesus, if you have, have and know Jesus as your Lord and Savior, and you choose by faith to accept the work of Christ on the cross for you, for the salvation and the forgiveness of your sins, then God wants to use you in advancing His kingdom and bringing about restoration where you are, in other people and in His creation. But first, you must be secure in your identity before you begin the task and be willing to be obedient to the Holy Spirit. And I just felt as I was preparing, and this came this morning, so this might be off, but anyway, maybe you feel like you've been thrown away. In this throwaway culture where things are done and we just toss them out, you know, we've got some, some rather expensive devices sitting at home. They were expensive when we bought them. There's two iPhones and an iPad. And you think, yes, those are nice. Like we got kids there. there. Curse took them to the i store this week to see if we could get them reset and fixed and whatever. Maybe we could trade them all in and get one device. And they're a bit old. And they offered you 18 rand. One eight. They offered us 18 rand for all three. Maybe you feel like that. Maybe you feel like, man, I was once valuable, but now I've been thrown away. Maybe you feel like God's forgotten you in the backwaters and like, and I want to say to you, friend, God is restoring dignity again this morning. Maybe you feel like you've been thrown away by relationships. Maybe you feel like you're alone and there's, maybe you feel like you've been left out in the cold by God, like you're out on this landfill somewhere waiting to be just covered over and buried one day. But I want to say to you this morning, friends, that God wants to restore you to your proper self through His Son, Jesus. God wants to bring that restoration about you. God does not throw away. He does not discard. God restores, and it is never too late for God. It doesn't matter what hand you give Him, you can deal Him a pair of twos and He still wins. God wins every time. And He is the God of restoration. And I want to ask you this morning, will you turn to Him? In your pain, in your suffering, in your anxiety, will you turn to God and allow Him to restore, through His Son Jesus, you to your true self?